So if you've seen the film The Wolf of Wall Street, you might remember there's a scene where a young shoe designer is in a boiler room full of these bro-ish stock traders. And while he's pitching his company, the traders are just being ruthless. They're cracking mean jokes or even throwing things at him. And the guy in that scene, he's playing a real person, a shoe designer named Steve Madden. We're about to hear the story of how Steve wound up in that room, about the price he paid for dealing with those traders, and how, in spite of everything, he built his shoe company into a massively successful brand. It's an incredible story. It first ran in July of 2018. Here you go. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs that that thought he was going to be super successful. You know, I was just trying to survive. And I'm very negative and very pessimistic. Unlike maybe some of the guys that you've done, you know, the shows. Yeah, with. totally. I'm sure they yeah. think that, you know, they, they're they going to be... Nothing can get me down. Nothing kind of can right get me yet. down. Me, I think I'm going out of business every other day. From NPR, it's How I Built This, a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, idealists, and the stories behind the movements they built. I'm Guy Raz, and on today's show, how Steve Madden took high-end shoe designs, gave them low-end prices, and turned his name into a $3 billion shoe brand. So when I was a kid, if you wanted to wear brand names and you couldn't afford the prices, you would go to Mervyn's or Marshall's or Ross, and you'd look for things called irregular items. Maybe it was a pair of guest jeans missing a zipper or an Esprit shirt with one arm slightly longer than the other. And it was no big deal because you still got the brand and you got it at Marshall's prices. But then, starting in the early 1990s, Brands like H&M and Zara started to go global, and it meant that all of a sudden, many more people had access to high fashion designs, but at a much lower price. And this is the wave that Steve Madden not only tapped into, but in a lot of ways pioneered, especially when it came to shoes. With Steve Madden's, you could all of a sudden buy a pair of black stilettos for 70 bucks that looked suspiciously like a $900 pair of Manolo Blahniks, or a $60 pair of Lego-like heels that were a knockoff of $1,000 Balenciagas. This was the genius of Steve Madden. He managed to carve out a very sweet spot between Nine West and Christian Louboutin. Now, this approach didn't come without consequences. The world of high fashion is an exclusive club, and Steve Madden is largely unwelcome. And one reason? Pedigree. Steve didn't apprentice at one of the great fashion houses. He didn't start out in Milan or Paris. In fact, Steve didn't even study design. And he's also kind of brash and a bit of a loudmouth. So brash, in fact, that he was willing to break the law to get ahead. Steve spent two and a half years in prison for financial crimes. It's an experience that completely changed his life, and we will get there. But long before that, Steve grew up in Long Island, New York. He was a scrappy, middle-class, half-Irish, half-Jewish kid. I was sort of a leader type, charismatic, sort of, always pretty similar to the way I am now. But I was, you know, small and had a big mouth and a little ambitious and a little obnoxious, probably. The kind of kid who would get in trouble at school? Uh, yeah, I always got in trouble. I was always in trouble. I had attention deficit disorder. I didn't know it then. Yeah. Nobody so, nobody knew it yeah, then. Yeah, that was the 60s, and so they didn't really talk about it then. But I couldn't sit still. Yeah. In Yiddish, would say, I had spilkes. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. 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 So school was not your your forte. No, um, the only difference is that I was I was a reader. So hmm. and I loved history, and I used to love to read about the moguls. You know, that was, I was obsessed for some reason. I was drawn to this thing about Louis B. Mayer and Samuel Goldwyn and these great entrepreneurs. That I, I mean, at a very young age, you know, I was like drawn to it. Yeah, why? Why do you think so? I, I don't know why. I mean, you know, I was I guess it was the the intersection 
of art and commerce, you know, was very interesting to me and still is. And those guys came from nothing, most of them. Yeah, and they were artists, but they were businessmen. So it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Your dad was in the textile business. Was Just out of curiosity, was your dad entrepreneurial? Did he have that kind of mind? Yes, my dad was. But, you know, he grew up in the Depression. And, you know, he was very limited, filled with fear uh, because he had seen so much poverty. So his he sort of capped his upside. He, he, was not a, he was not a risk taker. He wasn't a great risk taker, but he was a smart man. He was a businessman, but it, he never really made the big bucks because he was very safe, which in a way I admire him because he stayed in. I mean, it's easy to criticize people like that, uh, you know, but he was a, you know always provided. We weren't the we were right in the middle. I mean, we weren't, you know, rich or anything, but we weren't the poorest. But it was like, you know. People got a 10-speed bike, and they got Schwinn. I never got a Schwinn. And you wanted to be the kind of person who could buy that stuff one day? I did. I always did. Yeah, I always wanted to fly first class, you know? Like, I'd be riding in coach. (laughs) You know, I was like, get me in the front of this plane, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of thing. How'd you you end up working at a shoe store at age 16? So I worked in a shoe store in high school. You know, the neighborhood sort of cool shoe store. The the guy that started the store uh, went to high school with my brother, John. So it was a job. It wasn't like, hey, I want to go work in shoes. It was just a job. Just sort of fell into it. Yeah. But I fell in love with it right away. What did you fall in love with? So it's hard to explain, but at that moment in the shoe business, you know, it was a very exciting time because- This is like the early to mid 70s? It was, yeah, like 74. Mm-hmm. Before I even started, platform shoes were very big mm. for men. Well, it oh, was right, a yeah. really wild right. time in the shoe business, right, right, big right. platforms. Yeah. And so it was just very interesting, you know, I was into it. I was into the the creative sort of- vibe yeah. of the whole thing. What do you remember about working in that store? I remember working very hard, very motivated, even at a young age. And was that, I mean, when you were there, was were you thinking, shoes, this is me, this is my calling? Or were you, was it more like, I like selling stuff? I love selling stuff. You did. Yeah. I do. But I also like creating stuff. Yeah. And I like creating stuff to sell. It's always been sort of a core sort of philosophy of mine. I've never been like, oh, that's creative, but, you know, nobody wants to buy it. And then on the other hand, you know, just to sell without any kind of creativity is boring to me, too. So you are working, so, so you're in the store. The store is, by the way, is called Toulouse. Toulouse, yeah. And uh, what? who was the guy who ran it? So, yeah, there was this great guy. His name was Lance Rubin. And he, I really, most of what I know... I got from this guy. You were 16 and he was in his 30s? 27. Wow, he owned that store at 27? Yeah, yeah. And the thing about this guy was so interesting because he was a, a young man who was successful and creative. And I never saw that. Usually the people that had that I thought of as businessmen were like my father. Yeah. You know, they rode the railroad and they wore those long coats uh-huh. with the hats. Like Don Draper. Yeah. But anyway, Lance came along. He was this artist and he designed these shoes. And also the wholesalers that sold him would be asking him for input on designs. Oh, wow. Yeah, because he was an up-and-comer, you know, like a young gun. So you are a high school student working at the shoe store, but you have plans to go to college, right? You, you were going to go to college. Yeah. I went to the University of Miami in Florida. To study what? To study um, golf and sun tents. <laughs> How'd yeah. you do? Did you do well? I did good. Yeah. I did well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I loved learning, but it was, uh, I was on my own and it was too much. How how long did you last there? You know, it's a bit of a blur, but I think it was about 18 months. And and it wasn't for you? It wasn't for me. My dad did me the biggest favor by pulling me out of school. When I say pulled me out of school, he refused to pay another 50 cents for me to fool around in college. So I went to work. You went back to to Long Island? I went back to Long Island. And back to a a shoe store? Went to work in another shoe store. And shoes because you had experience doing that? That's right. I had experience. So it was kind of a famous store in Long Island called Jildor, Hmm. which most people know in New York. So you are, uh, and there you're also a sales guy, just dealing with customers in the store? 
Yeah, I was just a sales guy on the floor. Do, and so you're out of your sort of a college dropout. You're working at this shoe store selling shoes. And I know, was your dad or your mom, were they saying, Steve, what do you, you know, you're not going to work at a shoe store your whole life. Did they say that at all? Or did they kind of just leave you alone? There are people that said that to me. Guys my own age, you know, making fun of me for working in a shoe store, for sure. Hmm. You know, my father did not make fun of me. My father recognized that good hard work was good. So you're you're working in the shoe store, and and I guess at a certain point you go to to the city, to New York City, to, yeah. to work at another shoe well, store. Well, the guy that owned Toulouse, Lance, opened up a wholesale company called L.J. Simone, and he calls you out of the blue. Yes, pretty much, yeah. And he says, "Come to work, come sell." So that's what I did. It's like a little wholesale company. Yeah. And what happened was I went to work there and we blew it up, man. Well, how did you blow it up? You know, I went to work for them and it was like, boom, we made a nice company out of it. And wh- he was sourcing his shoes from shoe factories and then what? Yeah, he was designing the shoes and I was selling them. So he would design them, they would be made, and then you would go from door, store yeah, to store? and I would sell them. And he taught me how to design shoes. How? Yeah. Well, you know, there's certain tricks of the trade and knowing what people like and working with different constructions. And it was just the two of you at the beginning? There was a few guys involved, but, you know, I was one. I was at the beginning, and it got very successful. Who were you selling to? We'd sell to Macy's and department stores, and we sold to the bootlegger. I don't know if anybody's from Washington. I don't know. Anybody remember the bootlegger? We sold all over the country. And... Was that that point where you you start to think about maybe doing this for yourself, or did you think this is great? I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna. This is. I'm gonna just ride this train. You know, at some point I thought about doing it for myself. I was very happy there. Mm-hmm. You know, but at some point I thought, you know, I could do this. Yeah. You know, how I much got... revenue were they doing, and when you were working for him, how much money were they making? I would say they were doing maybe forty million a year. Wow. So yeah, it's big. which is like big. You know, they were. Yeah, we. Maybe something like that, yeah. Yeah. And and so what happened? Why did you leave? You know, I had taken it as far as I could take it. And um, I just didn't want to have a boss anymore. It was just time. You know, yeah. it was ready for me to sort of chart my own course. And you know, I was were, like 30. You were 30. So you were there for a long time. Yeah. I was like 31. 20s. And just to, just to be clear, at this point, you are single- you're not married, no kids at that time, right? Yes, single. And you were probably paid pretty well by Lance. I mean, you probably get making a decent living. Yeah, I was. I made a lot of money with him, you know, relative to the time. Yeah. Uh, and and you weren't worried at all about risking risking all that? And... I'm still worried about it. Okay, but then you were, you, were, you had this really good salary. <laughs> yes, had... yes. I'm worried. I was, I'm a worrier. You know, I'm a worrier. So, yes, but I just wanted to do it on my own. Yeah. This was also, I mean, it's kind of a wild time, right? I mean, you were you were drinking heavily. You were. I was uh, started using drugs and drinking. I was pretty much pretty inebriated most of my twenties. Hmm. You know, they say when an alcoholic hits bottom, you know, they keep there's another level of bottom to go. So yeah, it was pretty bad. How bad did it get? Well, you know. I could tell you a lot of stories about it. Um, But basically, I couldn't stop. And, you know, I was embarrassing myself. And it was starting to affect my work. And uh, I had to stop or die. Was that bad? Yeah. Hmm. Drugs and drink. Yes. Cocaine. Everything, you know. Hmm. And uh, I would work, you know. It went, I worked. I'd work, 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 and then get, Stoned hammered. at night, you yeah. know, hammered. Because you were working so hard, it was just like the thing you did. You just... Yeah. You thought you deserved it or you could justify it somehow. But, uh, oh, I was a mess. I was a mess. When when did you... How did you, how did you get out of that? I had some friends, you know, that pointed me towards a place where I could get sober. Did you go to AA or did you go to a clinic? I did. I went to AA. And that helped? It saved my life. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming it was after you you recovered that that you started Steve Madden? Yeah. I was sober when I started Steve Madden. 
I mean, it was just a miracle. You know, I started, I was got sober, I started this company, and, you know, my life completely changed. Hmm. And, and when you started the company, did you, did you have the cash to, to do it, to, to, to launch it? You know, I scraped together a little money, but basically no. Your own money. Yeah. And what was, uh, what, what was the idea? What was the first idea? The idea was to basically do the same thing, design and sell your own It was own exactly shoes. the same idea. And what was your first shoe? My first shoe was a clog. It was a backless clog that and who, I made. And who did you think would be your customer? That's a very good question. Uh, at the time, you know, I would say it would be my contemporaries, you know, so I was like 32, you know. So a 32-year-old woman. Yeah, I would say, because I didn't really think about it. I just wanted to make shoes, you know. It wasn't something that I thought. But what happened was I ended up making shoes for the Gen X customer. Those would be people around 40 today. Yeah. Right after, I guess that's right after the baby boomers, right? So they were, they were teens at yeah. that point. And I and discovered teens, yeah. this market by accident. There was, they were very ill-served. You know, basically we stepped into that at Steve Madden. And um, how many did you make? So, you know, the way it was, you know, we made it, we made some shoes and, you know, we just got this fabulous reaction, but not from the people I thought I was going to get a reaction from, which were my contemporaries, which was from the younger kids that were like, the phone was ringing, like, where do you get that shoe and all that stuff. So we knew that something was going on here. So that's the track that we went on. When you so when you decided to to start Steve Madden, did you have an office or were you working out of your? Apartment? No, I worked in a shoe factory. In a shoe factory. So you yeah. found a factory in New York, in Brooklyn, and and you worked with them, and then you made I guess some shoes, and then what did you do? Did you go to your former contacts that you had from? Yeah, you know Macy's and anybody that carried shoes, I sold, and then I would go to the national shows and sell them all over the country. But in that first in that first year, 1990, yeah, like you would go to shoe stores and they would take ten and pairs. You go with your you go with your sample case, and you'd lay your shoes out, and people would buy them, and that was it. Huh. So, what was happening? Yeah, was the market that I was selling to everybody in the shoe business walked away from it. The teenagers, you know, and stuff like that. The young. And it was a different generation, you know? And so they had their own thing, their own music and their own style. And we just tapped into that whole thing. And this was a market, explain this, this is a market at the time that was essentially abandoned by most shoemakers. You know, it seems like it. they just abandoned. I mean, Nine West, there was a company called Nine West that was dominating the industry. Of course, there was Nike and Reebok. But nobody was like making like funky little shoes. It was kind of a throwback to the 70s. Hmm you know, from that other era. So I kind of brought that back and I was just in the right place at the right time. Were they were they designed to be like cool, but also affordable and expensive? I've always been sort of democratic with my shoes. Do you remember um, how many, how much revenue you, you did in, in, in the first year? I probably did, I don't know, 500,000. So it's pretty good, pretty good first year. But yeah. And you named it Steve Madden because it seemed like the obvious thing to do. It seemed like an easy name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever think about using like a French name or like a European sounding? You know, it's funny because it was originally the first couple of shoes were called Soulier. <laughs> All right. It's like very sole, good. like the. Yes, right. it's a French word for slipper. Uh -huh. And so, you know, there was some dispute about that brand. Or maybe I just wanted to call it Steve Madden. I can't remember, but I switched it pretty quickly because yeah, you were there was one guy that called me up how dare you i bought soulier i don't want steve madden who do you think you are yeah i always and a guy is still he's still in the shoe business that guy and i always torture him when i see him all right so you've got this pretty good business going and year one what are you thinking are you thinking okay i mean did you have ambitions at that point already to make this into something huge? so so where i'm at is i started the business and, you know, I'm just not really don't have much money. I'm just sort of working hand to mouth. And a friend of mine who I grew up with went to work for this brokerage firm and they were raising money for small companies. This is Danny Porash. Danny Porash. Danny Porash. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to raise you. We're going to get you 
we'll raise you 600 grand and then we'll get you six million. He was working for a brokerage yeah, house. Yeah, he worked. He was a senior guy. At, mm. And uh, well, and he said to you, hey, you need to expand said, your money. You're really talented. I've known you my whole life. You know, what would you do if you got 600,000? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. 600,000 was like 600 million to me. Yeah. And then he said, well, not only will I get you 600 grand, but I'm going to get you $6 million when I take you public. <laughs> and I laughed at him, you know, because I probably had $30,000 in my huh. to my name. And so, of course, you're like, what, 33, 32? Something 30? like that, yeah. And you're thinking, you can raise me 600000 bucks. Let's Correct. do it. That's right. Uh, so he, right. so, so, so yes. Danny uh, helped you go public. Yeah, and he helped me go public, and his firm was called Stratton Oakmont. A very famous name for anybody who's seen the Wolf, Wolf of Wall, Wall Street. Street. Yeah. It was a pretty good movie, actually. My name is Jordan Belfort. The year I turned 26, I made $49 million, which really pissed me off because it was three shy of a million a week. I guess we should explain. Stratton Oakmont was this, like, called a pump and dump firm. Yeah, right? they used to call them boiler rooms. Right, and they would basically yeah. sell, they would sell really crappy companies. They would jack yes. up, get the stock yes. price jacked up. That's and then they true. would sell all the shares and make tons of money and yes. people would lose their shares. Yes. And so they basically were, wanted to do this with Steve Madden, right? They wanted to do it with Steve Madden. So Danny, I was the perfect yeah. guy for them. Because? Because, you know, I had a company and it was small and... They could do their thing with it, you know, it fit the profile. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Steve Madden. Yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> your name is on the box. <laughs> so that scene with me talking in front of the, it was very accurate. We should explain the scene for people who haven't seen it. You you go up in front of all these, um, these like traders in this boiler yeah, room. Yeah, I started talking about my shoes, thinking that they would they actually were, be interested. Tell but they the really shoes. weren't. I was just a piece of, it was just a piece of paper and a piece of meat Believe that they could not. sell. Believe it or not, though, the Mary Lou is actually the same as the Mary Jane, but it's black leather. <laughs> I, I want to just to digress for a moment because when people are listening to this budding entrepreneurs, I'm not one of those entrepreneurs that that thought he was going to be super successful. You know, I was just trying to survive. And I'm very negative and very pessimistic. Unlike maybe some of the guys that you've done, you know, the shows. Yeah, with. totally. I'm sure they yeah. think that, you know, they, they're they going to be... Nothing can get me down. Nothing kind of, can right? get me yeah. down. Me, I think I'm going out of business every other day. So it, at that time, this is like 93, I guess, when... when yeah, 92, 93. When so we went public. We went public. We went public. And how did the stock do? Well, they were totally manipulated. The stocks, they went up. And, it, you know, it was a pump. It was a classic pump and dump. And, and Only Steve Madden was a real company. Yeah. So if you kept that stock you would make on yeah. that day yeah. in 1993 and you own 10,000 shares, I haven't really done the math, but I think you would be worth a lot of millions money and yeah. millions of dollars today. So the Stratton sale... Go, the company goes public. Stratton takes you public. Yeah. All of a sudden, it raises how much money for you? I think the public offering was about seven million bucks. Wow. So all and we sudden. used it. I, I took it, and in very short period of time, from a half a million bucks, I was doing forty million a year or fifty million a year. And and what did that within money... thir within thirty six months? Incredible. So okay, you get all this cash from from the initial public offering. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, I mean, <laughs> did you ask any questions? I mean, I mean, these guys were, uh, they were totally breaking the law. I mean, they, yeah. th at that point, they were artificially inflating your stock. So did you, like, like, were you suspicious at all about Danny and about Stratton? I mean, did you, uh, did you think, hey, you know, <laughs> what are these guys doing? I knew it was too good to be true. Yeah. I knew it. So, you know, I lied to myself and I told myself that it was a gray area. You know, the trading in these stocks and the f flipping, they would sell me the stocks and I would sell them back to them. Just Steve Madden stocks? No, other? all the other deals. That, you, so they brought you in, in other, other deals. Other deals. They brought me into other deals. So I lied to myself. You know, everybody's doing it, you know, like that. But I knew in my heart that it was illegal and it was wrong. Was a part of it thrilling that you were getting away with it? Well, making that much money is certainly thrilling, for sure. 
but um, I wish that I hadn't done it. And But, you know, more than wishing I hadn't done it, because that's sort of an empty thing to say. I wish that I didn't feel compelled to do it. I wish that I didn't have that feeling that money was everything, because it's not. It's not everything. So I was greedy and foolish. Here's what I'm trying to figure out. You are this creative guy. You you create shoes, you design shoes, and you've got a really successful and growing business. And then on the side, you're doing this these weird stock trades that yeah. are shady and uh, Slim ultimately, shady. ultimately <laughs> illegal. Yeah. Why Why would you even do that stuff on the side you if know, you already had pers- the creativity in the business? I know, because you just, you know, you just get caught up. You just get caught up in this thing. But it, at a certain point, it can't be about money. It has to be about fulfillment and and. Weren't you fulfilled by just the creation of your shoes and and seeing your shoes out in the world? Well, that's a very heavy question. Uh, How one gets fulfilled. I'm still grappling with that today, you know. So there are moments where I'm very fulfilled, you know, and there are moments when I'm not. Um, I was raised to think that money was everything, you know. Money is the center of the universe. And if that's what your core belief is, you know, you'll do anything and you'll break the law. You know, it's like money's like a drug, you know, and we got in trouble. In just a minute, how Steve Madden pays and pays hard for his crimes. And eventually, how he comes back to the company he started to make it even bigger. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to How I Built This from NPR. Hey, welcome back to How I Built This from NPR. So it's 2002, and after being implicated in a stock manipulation scheme, Steve Madden goes on trial. He's convicted and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. So in the space of just a few years, he goes from being one of the most famous and successful shoe designers in America to sitting in a prison cell. What did you think? I mean, did you think I'm finished? My life is over? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Uh, You know, I thought, I thought I was, could have, my goose was cooked. But I did have the sense that I could get through it. Were there people who knew you, who didn't like you, who were just feeling like uh, he, he got his comeuppance? Oh, sure. Yeah, I had made such a success in the shoe business, and I was a bit of a rebel. So now people are going, ah, uh-huh, see, that's what happens when you do that. Where did you... Where, 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 in where Florida. You, you were sent to a... a Florida, yeah. A minimum security prison? Yeah, what they call a camp. Mm-hmm. And, and what, was the, your, what was your living situation like there? We lived in a barracks. You know, it's like a military barracks. You had your own room? I lived in a cube. <laughs> I lived in a cube and uh, with another guy or two. How did you, you know. pass the time? Well, read a lot, exercised a lot, and I taught some classes when I was there. Did you, when you got there and you knew that you were going to be there for at least, well, you were there for 31 months, but but 41, I think, was your sentence. 31 months. Yeah. 31 months. Yeah. Did you ever get depressed? Did you ever think, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to stay here for 31 months? <laughs> yeah. My first night, I looked up at the ceiling and I said, how the heck am I going to do this? How am I going to get through this? Did it go by faster than you expected? It seemed like 31 years. Wow. <laughs> but I quickly uh, ascertained early on that whining and moaning would not do me any good. And running around saying I was innocent would not do me any good. So I would try to get through this, try to better myself, if it sounds corny, but exercise and read and learn and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I did. When you went to jail, um, Steve Madden was doing very well, right? When I went to jail, it was doing well. Were you worried about the brand, that the name, your name was the brand, that your... Well, I had great people working for me. I was 
I was really worried about surviving and getting through it. You personally or the company? the prison. I was really more focused on getting through that experience. Did you think that you would ever go back to Steve Madden? You're the company you built? Yeah. You yeah. Did. So you had that horizon yeah, to look I did. forward to. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think – this is a really weird question, but I'm curious to, to hear your, your take on it. Um, if you could trade the time you were in prison for you know just continuing on and not, not, not having that experience, would you – would you do it, or, or do you think that, strangely enough, that that time being incarcerated was important for your development as a person? Um, yeah, uh, that's exactly right. I, I, I'm a very big believer in you know destiny and your path and all that hmm. corny stuff. I just believe it viscerally. So, I'm so grateful for my life uh, after prison. I married a great girl. I had great kids. I don't know that I would have had children had I not gone to prison. Hmm. So I regret some of my choices, uh, you know, shortcuts that I took or, you know, thinking that money was the most important thing. I regret decisions like that. Hmm. But I don't regret a day in prison. It was an amazing experience. It was very painful. I mean, the only thing I can – I've tried to describe it to people. Your heart gets broke every day. Yeah. When you're in prison, your heart breaks every day. The living in prison part is not as terrible as one might think. Hmm. Um, But, um, you know, your heart's breaking because you're not with the people you love. Hmm. That that's the difficult part of prison. It, It sounds like you became a much more empathetic person when when you were there and you saw people who were unlike you, who did not grow up like you, who came from different backgrounds, yeah. who had, who kind of ended up there because of circumstances. Well, particularly the the African-American experience really touched me. And um, young men dealing drugs, getting huge sentences, unfair drug laws that really were biased against black people. So that was, you know, to see problems in those communities, you know, to wit- talk to young black men. And hmm. it's a very complicated, you know, issue. I mean, yeah. You know, I just think I- I'll give you an example. This is a little thing. But, you know, when I grew up, I went to grade school in the 60s. Right. We, w- we learned that Robert E. Lee was a kindly gentleman. Yeah. He was he was called a hero. Like he let <laughs> he defended his homeland of Virginia. Hmm. And that's just that was that's just complete racism. But we didn't realize it. It's the subtle form of racism. Hmm. So that's the kind of thing that uh, you know, those kind of feelings or stuff that came up in prison, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. That I learned and read more about it. Okay, so you I think you get out in uh in two thousand five and and do you remember the day that, that you were released? You know, that's such an interesting question because I don't really. Wow. It was a bit of a blur. I I think of it now. I mean, I thought about that day when I was away for so long, what it was going to be like. And I can't remember it now. I really can't. My wife picked me up. And we should mention that while you were in prison, you fell in love. Yes. Yeah. And she picked me up. She was an employee of the company. I know that we had sushi. And I just... I uh, I just can't remember. It was so, it was such a blur. There was so much coming at me. You know, when you're locked up after 30 months, you know, everything is like amazing. Like a slice of pizza is like, oh my God, like this is the greatest thing ever. So you, you're out. You're back, back in, in society. Back, you got your freedom back uh how long did it take you to, to to adjust to to having control over your own schedule your day-to-day schedule well there's a transition period you go into a halfway house but i was fortunate because i had a job you know i came right back to work so hmm. it was an amazing time and what was your position when you came back to to your company um the same position i'm in today which hmm. is the founder which is the chief cheerleader mm-hmm. we have fabulous people running steve madden um I wasn't a great CEO. Why weren't you a great CEO? You know, I'm just, I'm 
not detail oriented and uh my talents are suited in other things you know yeah when did you when did you realize that you were not cut out to be a ceo well when it's the business is small you can kind of be the ceo yeah you know everybody so you know everybody you live and breathe it and then you could be a ceo because you touch everything but then a business you know once a business gets past a certain point you know it's impossible for someone like me to to do that job but when you came back to the company in 2005 i think within 4 years uh steve madden hit revenue of of over half a billion dollars so so what happened in that time like how did the company grow what what was the strategy that allowed you to grow so much so our goal was to you know make great shoes and you know i think that that kind of like one out at the end of the day the marketing wasn't super fantastic it was just great shoes great prices great value and uh you know i think that we just wore everybody out with that you know more people were giving us their open to buy and we opened more stores you know and thing and our internet business exploded but the big thing about steve madden i have to say and i've said this many times was the people at steve madden is that i've hired so many great people it starts with recognizing my own limitations i'm weak at that so let me get somebody that can do that for me and uh you know that's really the story it's people so you come you come back to the company and you uh f- by the way you had plenty of money at that point i mean you could have you could have sold your shares walked away very rich man uh and just kind of i don't know done something else or focused on yourself uh yeah. why why did you want to go back to the company well actually it's it, that's an eternal that's a i grapple with that all the time so i love m- the idea of making shoes and the people want to buy and i love seeing my shoes being worn and i just love all of it and i love making money let me be clear about that i love it i love the whole thing what, what because you don't need more of it so what do you love about it well okay that's a good you, these are great questions and i want to ask other entrepreneurs or other <laughs> people like so how do you stay motivated you know let's say you've got you know a few dollars in the bank and you know that you the rent is paid and all of that sure. and uh so what keeps you going i i once asked Haim Saban a similar question you know who Haim Saban is right the media mogul yes and you know he grew up like dirt poor in alexandria egypt he came from literally nothing right and uh i said you know what what what's the big deal cuz he 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 was waiting to sell his company to disney for i don't know uh you know more than a billion dollars yeah and I said, but well, you know, why, why not just take five hundred million when they offered that to you? He said because it wasn't worth that. You know, I wanted I wanted to be a billionaire. And 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 the point he made was that it wasn't about the actual dollar amount. It was for him. It was a mark. It was like a yeah. It was like a mark. He could say, okay, I've reached this point, and then I can reach this point, and then it's this point, and it's it's like a demarcation point of success. Yeah, it's a heavy question. It really is. But of course it's a luxury that people with money have to be able to talk about this stuff. You know, there's somebody out there that will listen to this and you know, they've got to pay their rent next Friday and they'll say, "Well, listen to this idiot talking about it." You know, and I agree with them. No, but, but you know, it does human, get lost. But it's I about know. human motivation, right? Like Yeah, the money is the money, but but it's something I think about a great deal because I feel so good if, if I have had, had a great day at work where I'm inspiring and, and and inspired at the same time it's such an amazing feeling there's no amount of money that can replicate that yeah so i guess that's what i want you know inspire and be inspired do you do, what was the last shoe that you designed just out of curiosity the last shoe i designed was last week uh, <laughs> last it was week a sneaker with studs you designed a shoe last week oh yeah yeah we have a factory in uh, long island city just outside the east river in manhattan but i'm always fiddling with shoes and um thinking about shoes of course i have a great team that does most of the work and i take most of the credit now you perceive you you don't seem to be a super obsessed over your own personal style you're like you got the baseball cap thing going you got uh right you're not wearing like uh designer like runway outfits every day no 
No, I'm, I look like a garage mechanic some days <laughs> on that runway. Yeah, I wear T-shirts and jeans. I'm very lucky. That's I, I don't take that for granted. I'm blessed that I'm the ability to wear a nice clean T-shirt every day. Did you ever feel like, I don't know, like some of these fashion folks kind of were snobby about you that they, I don't know, they didn't let you into their club because you weren't from, you know, Milan or didn't go to a art school or because yeah. you wore baseball caps and uh, <laughs> and you were, you know, kind of kicking their butts with, with, with yeah. these sort of shoes that were a fraction of the price. Did, did yeah, there's, they, a bit, was, there's a bit of that. There was a bit of that hmm. big time. It's not so much anymore. Hmm. Did it used to bug you? Yeah, it bugged me. It bugged me a lot. You know, I w- or I would go into a high-end department store, like a Barney's, let's say, and they wouldn't carry Steve Madden. They wouldn't dare carry Steve Madden. But all the people working in the store wore Steve Madden. Hmm. It would just drive me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That happened so many times. And still to this day, there's a bit of that going on. Hmm. Um, it's frustrating. But if you step away from the balcony, like me looking at this, I would be like, who cares? <laughs> you crushed them all. Like, so big deal. Well, I once was upset because uh, they put Puff Daddy in the CFDA. The CFDA is a club for what? CFDA, it's a, something for designers. Fashion. CFDA, yeah. Uh-huh, right. Very, very posh. And? And they put Puffy in there. And I thought to myself, Puffy? He's not des- what does he have to Wait, do? Wait, are with- you in there? I'm not. They won't you let are me in. N- even no. to this day, no, they, they won't wouldn't. let you. You cannot get into their club. I'm not allowed in the building. So, you know, and the, and I, they would say, well, you copy, uh, you know, Balenciaga or whatever it is. You yeah. Know, whatever the, you know, and we we definitely are aware of expensive shoes that are out there, you know. But, but I mean, Madden, in some ways, a lot of these these high end designers could make the you could make the case that, you know, the younger crowd will enter the market by buying Steve Madden shoes, and then there's this aspirational to buy you, a Manolo Blahniks one. I, I always say it's a gateway drug of shoes, Steve hmm. Madden. They're not buying Louboutins or Manolos without starting with Steve Madden. So Manolo should give me tons of love for that. I reach much, many more people than him. Do you think that there will be a point where you are acknowledged by your peers? Is that important to you? I'm acknowledged by a lot of people probably too much Mm. you know young men coming up really know and identify with the struggle and the grind and what i've done so i think there's a different kind of respect going on not what i had thought but another kind of respect and i feel it all the time you know i'm walking down the street and people shout out to me and you know it's it's the real thing how much of of your success do you think is because of your skill and intelligence and hard work, and how much of it is because of luck? I think a lot of it is luck. I do. I think my own sort of philosophy is that the window of opportunity opens uh, for you several times in life, for one. And I think the intelligence comes from knowing when that window is open and you know, being able to jump through that window because you could have all the talent in the world, but sometimes the window is just not open. Hmm. Besides the, obviously the stuff that landed you in prison, um, what are, are there mistakes that you made early in, in the business that you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Let me just say that, uh, mistakes can be a very good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so there were some mistakes that we made, but we did so many great things. And the thing about that is, if you start getting gun shy and start being afraid to make a mistake, you'll never have the brilliant ideas. You'll never have the big ideas. Hmm. You know, if you just try to hit the safe, the safe ones, you know, then you're you're doomed. I feel like. Yeah. So you need to make mistakes. Yeah. You need to make mistakes. You need you need to goof. Because if you're not goofing a few times, it means you're not reaching. That's Steve Madden, founder of Steve Madden Shoes. And by the way, if you want to find out more about Steve's story, he's got a memoir coming out in a few months. It's called The Cobbler, How I Disrupted an Industry, Fell from Grace, and Came Back Stronger Than Ever. Uh, by the way, how many how many pairs of shoes uh, do, you, do you actually own? I don't own a lot of shoes. What's the fanciest brand you, you own? I own Johnson & Murphy. 
That's the fanciest <laughs> brand you own? I do. I own Johnson & Murphy shoes. They're the greatest. Yeah, my dad wore them. <laughs> 